thank you, God, that you have good plans. I needed this this morning. I had a, actually had a really good morning and I was all set and I was all prepped to be here today. And then 10 minutes before service started, I forgot how to drink coffee and spilt it all over my white shirt. I had to run home and I was a bit frazzled. So I needed this time in worship just to reset, to get back in the zone and get sorted again. So God, I thank you that, that you led this team to lead us in worship today. I thank you that you helped create a space and an atmosphere where we can just step in and be in your presence, God. I thank you. I thank you for this place. I thank you for this church. I thank you for these people. And I thank you that you have good plans for every single one of us, that you have a hope and a future for every single one of us. And even when it doesn't always make sense, even when we don't see it, it doesn't change the truth of it, that you are for us. God, I pray today is a day where we just get to seek and see and discover more of who you are and more of what you have for us. More, be able to see more of the plans that you do have for us, that we can be, make sure that we align with those plans so that we can be stepping into the future that you have called us to step into. God, I thank you that you love us, that you are for us, that you sent your son to die for us so that we can know you. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, band. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. All right, can I get the house lights on, please? It's very dark. There we go. Good morning, everybody. I'll try again. Good morning, everybody. There we go. It was so quiet. I don't like it. So for those who don't know me, my name is Chris. I am one of the pastors here. And thank you for my TV. Thank you. I'm one of the pastors here at Epicenter Church, and I just want to double down on what our MC said before. Welcome. It's so good to see you here today, whether you're here in person, whether you're tuning in online. We are so incredibly grateful that you have chosen to spend this time in the house with us today. We just love that you are here, that you are, and that, that you want to spend this time with us and with God. So I'm going to jump straight into it today. So we are continuing with our sermon series called The Church Is. And This is week three, but the quick overview is, in week one, we started with this thought, which is going to overarch the entire entire series, which is that the church is a movement, and movements move people to life, with the idea being that the church is more than just the service, the church is more than the band, the church is more than whoever's preaching, the church is more than just what happens here on a Sunday, the church is meant to be a movement which recognizes that Jesus came to bring a, a rich and satisfying life. And the church is, is meant to move people towards it, move people away from a life that is destructive, that is not healthy, that is not good, and move them towards a life that is rich and full and abundant as God intended. And then in week two, we continued on with the idea being that the church is you. The church is me. The church is us, that we, that the people are the church with The challenge being that we aren't the church when we just turn up together. We're the church when we work together. In that it is more than just rocking up on a Sunday and ticking a tick box to say, yes, I've been at church. But unless you're actually rolling your sleeves up and getting into people's lives and serving people, then you're not really engaging with the church. The church happens when Christians get together and serve each other. So that brings me to this week, which... The big thought for today is this, that the church is a combination of sick and healthy people, with the second idea being that being friendly is good, but being accepting is better. But with the first point, the church is a combination of sick and healthy people. And I know when I say that, there are certain analogies or metaphors that come to people's minds. There there are thoughts that that people think of when they hear this, and it's it's a thought that has been through church history, I, I can find quotes going back to, to St. Augustine that sort of refers to this idea. And what people often hear when they see this is that the church is a hospital. The church is a hospital for sick people, where sick people can come up and whether their sickness is trauma or addiction or anxiety or depression, or whatever it may be, they can rock up to church and the church, as in you and me, God's people, we will nurture them back to health. We will move them away from where they're struggling, where they're hurting, where they're not living a godly life and move them to a better life that Jesus wants for them, right? So that, 
It makes a lot of sense. And the idea that the church is a hospital, it comes from this scripture generally. It says, as Jesus left the town, he saw a tax collector named Levi. Well, Levi's not listening. There he is. Hey, Levi. He's not a tax collector. He's a youth. He's not a tax collector yet. He saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at his tax collector's booth. Follow me and be my disciple, Jesus said to him. So Levi got up, left everything and followed him. Later, Levi held a banquet in his home with Jesus as the guest of honor. Many of Levi's fellow tax collectors and other guests also ate with them. But the Pharisees and their teachers of religious law complained bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. So the idea, of course, is that we want sick people. We want people who are broken, who are hurting, who aren't living how we think that they should be living according to the Bible. We want them so that they can meet Jesus, right? So that's the idea of the church being a hospital. I have a problem with this, I have a major problem with it, and, and this is why. It was only two weeks ago today, my daughter, the one who tried to lift my wife's dress up on stage just before, <laughs> Amelia, four years old, she woke up um, two weeks ago, Sunday morning, she couldn't open her eye, it was all swollen. And we thought she had conjunctivitis because the baby had had that during the week, so that's what we assumed. And then upon some advice, we drew a line around the swelling so we could keep track of it. And within half an hour, we're watching the swelling spread from, you know, from her eye onto her nose, down to her cheek. And we're like, that's a problem. Let's get her in the car. And we took her down to the hospital. And four or five hours later, yeah, after nurses had come and poked and prodded and taken temperatures and blood pressure and, and asked all the questions and the doctors had come and had a look at it all. And they'd made the decision to admit her overnight, to, to put a cannula in and give her some IV antibiotics for 24 hours. And then the next day, the doctor came and reassessed and he was happy that the swelling was going down and he sent her home with, with more medicine to, to use for the next week or so to make sure she was better. And I am thankful for the hospital. I'm thankful for the staff there. I'm thankful that they knew how to treat her. I'm thankful for the fact that they looked after her, that they kept her safe. I'm thankful that they equipped Hannah and I to be able to maintain her health once she left. Yeah. But let me tell you, I could not have gotten out of that place fast enough. And I am in no hurry to go back. The church is a hospital. I hope not. I hope that people don't just rock up when they are sick until they feel better, then they leave never to be seen again until their lives fall apart and they feel like they need more support. The church is a hospital. I really, really hope not, but I acknowledge that we act like it is sometimes. And what that looks like is if the church is a hospital, it means the Christians, the pastors, the leaders, the mature Christians who have been coming for a while, we end up appointing ourselves as the doctors and the nurses. And what that looks like in practice is this, is that a new person rocks up. And for the sake of example, this new person has issues. Whether it's trauma, whether it's addiction, whether, whether they're just blatantly living a life that is contrary to what the Bible teaches they should be living. And we are, we're good with them. We welcome them. We make them a coffee, right? We, we, we connect with them. We engage with them. We, we, we can, we're really, really friendly. We invite them to small groups. We connect with them. We build them up. We pray with them. We teach them. We do all the good things, right? And we should be doing that. And what the talk behind the scenes sounds like is, how good is it that so-and-so has come to church? What a testimony that Jesus can reach that person and get them into the church. And there's a, there's a buzz and there's an excitement. And why? Because the church is a hospital and this is a sick person. We get a chance to heal them. But after three months or so, a switch flicks. A switch that looks and sounds like this person's been coming to church for three months. They've been going to hospital for three months. They've been getting treatment for three months. Why aren't they better yet? It looks like us looking at them and going, we, they should be, they were here, they should be here. Why aren't they? What is wrong? And then we decide that it's not worth our time, it's not worth our effort, and we move on to the next person. What we end up doing is that we end up performing triage on newcomers. And if we don't see them getting better the way we want them to in the time frame that we want them to be better, we determine that 
It's not worth our time, our effort, or even the risk of associating with them. And the talk behind the scenes switches from, how good is it that yeah, this person's made it to church? And it goes from, I'm not so convinced that this person's genuine about their faith. <laughs> the talk becomes, I just, I just don't know how they can call themselves a Christian. I don't know if they're really saved. I don't, okay, it's good that they're here, I guess, but I don't want to see them on stage. I don't want to see them leading or serving. I don't want to be around them and I'm worried about the bad influence they may have on other people. We perform triage and we go, they haven't moved towards where they're supposed to move in the time frames that we set. So the issue with the church being a hospital is that we, it puts time limits on how long we feel like we should be extending grace for. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. But if you think you are one of the healthy ones, I've got some bad news for you. <laughs> Maybe better worded. The church is a combination of sick and slightly less sick people. Or the church is a combination of sick and healthier people who are still sick. Because the truth is every single one of us has sin, every single one of us has sickness, every one of us has areas that we need to, to work on and improve in our relationship with God. doesn't matter where we are at on that journey. Every person is sick. The disease is called sin. And sin, in simple terms, is anything that takes our, takes our focus, our attention away from God. The big stuff, the obvious ones, like if you are a killer, if you're a thief, if you're a cheat, yes, we know that that is destructive and bad for relationships. But your sin may not be that big. It may be smaller. It might be your TikTok addiction where you just don't have time to read your Bibles. Whatever it might be, the disease is called sin and it moves us away from where God wants us to be. Right? John 10.10 10 says, The thief's purpose is to steal and to kill and to destroy. But my, Jesus' purpose is to give them a rich and satisfying life. The thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy because he wants you sick and he wants to keep you sick. The thief, the enemy, the devil, Satan, I don't care what you call him, we believe is an entity that is actively opposed to God's plans, who is actively outworking to try and pull us away from the life that God wants us to leave and, and kill us, to let us, make us miss out on all that God has for us. And to settle for something far, far less. The thief, what he does, he comes and whispers to us and says, you don't need to get better. He says that addiction that you are struggling with, it can't be that bad because it feels good. He says that those lies that you tell people, they can't be that bad because at least you profit off them. The, thief's, the thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. He wants to keep you sick by convincing you that there is no better. That that addiction, that depression, that, that anxiety, that unforgiveness, that whatever it may be, it just is what it is. That that's just your lot in life and you just have to suck it up and push through it. The thief wants you to forget that there's another option, that there's another choice, that there's another way. And he wants to keep you focused on all the negative. The thief wants to come and keep you sick by yelling at you, by saying you are not good enough, you are not smart enough, you are not strong enough, you are not whatever enough to be able to choose a different path. And the thief is convincing because the thief speaks to our insecurities, speaks to our doubts. The thief speaks to me and says, Chris, you're still that scared little schoolboy on the playground who used to get bullied. Nobody likes you. Nobody liked you then. Nobody likes you now. He says, Chris, you may have the title of pastor, but that's the only reason people listen to you because they feel like they have to. You don't have any real value or worth of anything to say. And I know this is a lie 99% of the time. I know this is a lie. And normally it's water for ducks back, get behind me, Satan, all that good stuff. But sometimes when I'm having a bad day, when things are hard, it hits something, it hits a nerve, and I go, well, maybe you're right. And then I start to focus on that, and I focus less on God. I don't know what the thief, what the enemy says to you. Maybe he says, nobody loves you. Maybe he says that you are just going to be alone forever. You're always the bridesmaid, never the bride. That, that your lot in life is to be happy for your friends as they find companionship, but not for you. 
Maybe he says that you're not smart enough to get the, the grades that you need at school. So you're not going to be able to get into that uni. You're not going to get that job you want. You're not going to be able to get that life you want. So why even bother trying? I don't know what the enemy, what the thief says to you, but you know. Oh, I hear crying kids. No. Oh. Anyway, distracted. You know. <laughs> so, you know what the enemy says to you because when you were down, when you were having a bad day, when you are struggling, those insecurities, those doubts, they come to the surface and they come again and again and again. And you can't shut them down. And that is the enemy poking at that wound. He is poking at your insecurity. He is going, you need to focus on this. You need to focus on your low self-esteem. You need to focus on your anxiety. You need to focus on your depression. You need to focus on whatever it may be. And whatever you do, don't look to God. That's what the thief loves to do. In First Peter, it says, stay alert. Watch out for your great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Do you know who lions prey on? The weak. Those who in moments of weakness have fallen away from the pack. The enemy can't eat you, can't devour you if you are in active and healthy relationship with God. But as soon as those doubts creep in, those insecurities creep in, those, that, that confusion creeps in, then, then you're a target and the enemy goes, excellent, now I can get you. And what I love is that Jesus comes along and he says, stuff that. <laughs> he says, no. He says, no. He says, there is another way. There is another choice. There is another option. And then he, Jesus comes along and says that it is him. And he demonstrates that because he jumps in to you know, meals and stuff with these tax collectors, with these people that society don't generally like. He jumps in and, and he engages with them. Jesus says that there is a better choice. There is a better way. There is another option. And he, and he shows that by jumping into these people that society probably aren't overly fond of, that, pe that people that the enemy was probably having a field day with. You know, for a little bit of context, so Jesus is eating with the tax collectors. For the, for the, for, for the context, the tax collectors at the time, well, if you don't like paying your taxes now, let me tell you, that's never changed. Levi and the other tax collectors, they, their job was to get people's taxes as set by, by the authorities. And then it was to deliver it to the treasury, so to speak, and then, and then they'll get paid a wage. But what they often did is that they would inflate how much people had to pay. In simple, you know, round numbers, if, just say the tax rate was 10%, and you've made $1,000, and you go, cool, I have to pay 100. Levi would go, no, 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 the, the tax rate's actually 15%, and then he would pocket the extra $50. And he would, he would steal. He would steal. So when he's at this banquet that he's hosting with Jesus... He's there with the other tax collectors because nobody else wants to associate with them. It does say there's other people there, other friends of the tax collectors there. I imagine they weren't great people either. If you're friends with the thieves and the liars and the scum of society, you're probably not the best person yourself as a general statement. So Jesus goes and eats with these people to make a point that they are who need him most. To say that even if, even if you are messed up, even if you are bad, even if you are wrong, even if you're not living a godly life, Jesus still wants to know you. Jesus still loves you. Jesus still wants to be in community and engage with you. And when Jesus does this, when Jesus does go in and, and, and lower himself, so to speak, two really, really, really important things happen. They're found here. But the Pharisees... And their teachers of religious law complain bitterly to Jesus' disciples. Why do you eat and drink with such scum? And Jesus answered them, healthy people don't need a doctor, sick people do. I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, but those who know they are sinners and need to repent. Two really important things. One's the easy one. Jesus is saying that sick people need him. That those who aren't living a godly life, that haven't got it all sorted, they're the people who need Jesus. Right, that's why he's eating with them. That's why he's happy to be in community with them because he knows that they need God. 
as a church, that means we want sick people. We want broken people. We want people who are rough around the edges. We want all people so that they can come and meet Jesus. But the harder the pill swallow, and the bit that I have struggled with and the bit that I have felt challenged by as I prepped this is that the Pharisees and the teachers of the religious law, or in more modern te- context, the pastors, the ministers, and the priests don't get it. They miss it completely. Instead of going, hey, this is good. These people need God. They go, why would you waste your time and effort on these people? Why would you commune with those people? Why would you enter relationship with the bad people? Aren't you worried it's going to taint your relationship? Aren't you, going, aren't you worried it's going to taint how people perceive you? Aren't you worried about how it looks? Those guys are no hopers. Don't worry about them. Just leave them be. Focus on, on, on the religious people. They, they've got it sorted. And Jesus is like, no, you idiots. <laughs> the whole point is that these people need me. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. But if you think you are one of the healthy people, can I encourage you to check again? Because I am 100% convinced of this. If one of the Pharisees looking in and judging Jesus for eating with these tax collectors and sinners and whatnot, if one of those Pharisees had stopped and said, you know what, maybe I've got a pride issue. Maybe I have believed my own hype and, and my position as a religious leader. Maybe I'm no better than anybody else. Maybe I do have stuff to work on. Maybe I'm not perfect. I'm confident if one of them had said that, Jesus would have said, hey, this guy gets it. Come and join me at the table. Because he would have realized his sickness and thus his need for Jesus. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. But none of us are the cure. None of us are the treatment plan. None of us are meant to be the doctors. There is only one doctor and we all need him and his name is Jesus. It's as simple as that. So what do we do? Well, we keep doing what we do well. We keep welcoming we, keep, we do. We keep being friendly. When somebody rocks up and they're, and, and they're not living a godly life and they've got issues or whatever it may be, hurts, drama, whatever, we welcome them. We say, hey, it is so good to see you today. And we get to know them and we engage with them and we become friends with them and we, and we disciple them and we bring them into small groups. We do all that good stuff. We need to keep doing that. We need to keep being friendly. But we need to be careful that we don't miss what Jesus has done, that we don't miss what Jesus is showing us, right? The Pharisees are like, why would you waste your time with these people? That sounds really familiar to me because it's an argument, it's a conversation I've seen repeated all throughout church history and I hear it today and this is what it looks like. But the, Pharise- but the mature Christians complain bitterly. Why would the church eat and drink with members of the LGBT community? Not that long ago, but the mature Christians complained bitterly. Why would the church eat and drink with divorcees? Why would they eat and drink with people of colour not that long ago? What we do is that we end up picking our sin or sinners, whatever group, the areas of society that we think are lesser, that we're not comfortable with, and we shun it. We push it down, we push it aside, and we say, we don't want any part of that somehow missing that when Jesus saw people who were outsiders, he said, hey, you, come with me. I'll make you one of my disciples. When we're not careful, we become modern-day Pharisees, right? But what we need to keep doing, as I said, is being friendly. Because being friendly is good, but being accepting is better. And what that looks like in practical terms, I heard this story uh, during the week of another pastor who visited a church, and he wasn't going as the guest pastor, he was just out of town and went, just want to go to church. And he gets to this church, and he is welcomed incredibly. The welcomers are like, so good to see you, nice to meet you. Oh, it's your first time here. How do you have your coffee? And they organized coffee for him. They gave him a quick tour of the building, let him know what the series that, yeah, that, that pastor was speaking on, all, gave him all the information. He, they connected him with a group of people, started making some friendships, so to speak. He was like, cool, once the service starts in 20 minutes or so, come grab me, I'll find you a good seat. 
The service starts, he go, this pastor goes in. Service is great. Worship's phenomenal. MCs are clear and concise. The sermon is on point that after the service, he's back out in the foyer with that group of people that he got introduced to beforehand. And it's good. It's friendly. There's good banter there. They're making connections. They're making friendships, or at least he thought so. And then after 15 minutes or so, the group that he's talking to all kind of check their watches. And they're like, oh, yeah, anyway, it was good to meet you. Uh, hopefully we'll see you next week. We're all going to the park for fish and chips. And off they went. Did you hear it? All they had to do was say, hey, we're going to the park to have some fish and chips. Do you want to join us? Instead, that what they said, not intentionally, but what they said was, I'm not going to eat and drink with you, outsider. Now, that's just one example. And there is a million reasons when it would not be appropriate to invite a new person to your afternoon plans. You've got a family gathering. Don't take the new person. You've got a hot date. No, just the two of you go. All right? Like, <laughs> plenty of re- but, but that's not what happened in this scenario. There are plenty of times where it's, but the point is, in that moment, they had an opportunity to be accepting, but they settled for friendly. They had an opportunity to invite this person in and actually make them feel part of it. But instead they went, our church duty is done, bye. And off they went. They were friendly, no doubt about that. They did a good job in their church role. But they stopped being the church as soon as the day finished. Maybe harsh, but they became the modern day Pharisees because they went, why would we eat and drink with this person, not because of their sin in this case, but because they were an outsider. They weren't part of the in crowd. They weren't part of the clique. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people, and every single one of us is sick. Every single one of us needs a doctor, and that doctor's name is Jesus. What I've learned is that It is not my responsibility to determine how quickly God will work in somebody. It is not my job to look at somebody's life and go, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that wrong, you're doing that. It's not my job to point out all the areas in their life when they aren't living correctly. It is not my role to pass judgment. It is not my job. It is not Pastor Rob's job. It's not any of the leader's job. It's nobody's job but God's. What we need to do is simply remember that every single one of us needs Jesus. Every single one of us needs Jesus. It is our job to accept the sinner, to accept the sick, and to trust that their path to health is in God's hands. Not to put time limits on it, not to put restrictions, not to put conditions on it, not to say, yeah, 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 but if they just get to here, then I will let them be more involved. Or if they can just prove that they're not living this way anymore, then then I'm confident of their salvation. That's not our problem. Our job is to say, hey, you sick person, come with me and let me introduce you to the doctor. It's not my job to fill his role. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. We need to understand that all of us are in the sick category. And as such, every single one of us needs Jesus. Every single one of us needs Jesus. Yeah, maybe you could argue that some of us need him more than others, but I don't think so. I don't think that's a healthy argument. I think the reality is I am just as broken as anybody else. I have just as many issues and and things that God is working on me as everybody else does. And once I understand that, I realize I'm not better than anybody, that I don't need to pass judgment because I'm not trying to puff myself up and go, oh, look at us, we're the righteous in crowd. Jesus says he, he didn't come to seek those who think they are righteous. Key word there is think. I don't think the Pharisees are righteous. I think they've puffed themselves up and believed that they are righteous. They've they've had pride and as such they are too arrogant to see what needs to be done. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. We need to be friendly. We need to be accepting because being friendly is good, but being accepting is better. So a couple of questions to leave us with today. Are you accepting of people or just friendly? 
Are you accept? Are you friendly to people while you are here? And you're, you're deliberate at engaging and meeting people and, and, and praying with them and just being a good person while you are here. But as soon as you leave this spot place, you go, cool, wipe my hands clean of that and, I'm, and I'll talk to them again next week. Are you putting time limits on how long you extend grace to people? Are you deciding how quickly God should fix things? How long somebody needs treatment for? How long before we go, oh, well, God's obviously not going to work with them. They've just rejected him. And have you become a modern day Pharisee and forgotten that you need Jesus just as much as anybody else? Have you let your maturity in faith convince you that you've made it? That you are now qualified to, 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 to call out and judge sin to pass judgment on people? That you are somehow elevated above those people that you, okay, you've met Jesus, you've hung out with Jesus, and now you're kind of on Jesus' level? I don't know where everybody here is at. There'll be some people here, it may be their first time in a church. They have no idea who Jesus is. Have no idea what I'm talking about. That's okay. There are people who have been coming for a little bit, but they don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. They don't know what faith looks like, but they just come out of habit or because they're dragged along by their parents or whatever the reason may be. And there are people here who are here and they've been here for a while and they we, I, have become really good at building a persona that is church acceptable. Putting a mask on to, so that we don't let people see our brokenness, that we don't let people see us, where we come and present ourselves as, as we're all good. Yeah, I'm, I've got God with me. What could go wrong? And, and we don't acknowledge, we don't be vulnerable, we don't share the struggles and the hurts. We build ourselves up. No difference to what the Pharisees did. I don't know where you're at. What I do know is that we all need Jesus. And what I do know is that even though we get it wrong, horribly wrong sometimes, sometimes we do focus too much on being like a hospital and as it becomes our job to try and fix people, it ain't. But we do that sometimes. I acknowledge that and I apologise for it. Even when the people get it wrong, can I assure you that Jesus doesn't? That he knows you? He loves you? He desires connection with you? He wants to work through whatever it is you are working through. He wants to support you and guide you and grow you no matter how long that process takes. The church is meant to be a combination of sick and healthy people. But I guess if I'm being more honest about it, it's the church is a combination of sick people and Jesus. A combination of sick people and Jesus because no matter who we are, how far we think we've gone, how good we are at seeing the flaws in other people's lives, every one of us has a ways to go. Let me pray. Father, I just, I thank you that you are good. I thank you that you see the outsider and you say, come inside. I say, thank you, God, that you see the sick, the broken, the struggling, the hurting, and you say, come on in. And you don't put conditions, you don't put restrictions, you don't put time limits on that. You, you just say, come with me. And if they do, you are there with them and you are supporting them and you are growing them and you are loving them. Not because you have to, but because that is who you are. God, I thank you that, I thank you that it is not our job to fix everybody. 
It's too big a job to do. We'll get it wrong too many times. I thank you, God, that you know exactly what people need, what time frames they need it in, that you know the path forward to what everybody's individual circumstances need and you can work with everybody, that there is no limitations to what you can do. I pray, God, that we realise today that yes, there may be certain times where we have to call out bad behaviours, but we should never be unaccepting of people. We should never be using people's uh, behaviours and decisions as an excuse to drive them away. We should be seeing that stuff and drawing them closer so that they can meet you, God. I pray, God, that if there is judgment in anybody's heart, that it is stripped away today because there's no place in your church. I pray, God, that we get more people who are sick, who are broken, who are struggling, who are hurting, who have whatever the issues may be, not because we want the glory of fixing them, but because we want them to meet you so that you can help them. And God, I pray, I pray that all of us, if we have a mask on, if we have a persona that we put on on Sundays so that we we appear church safe or church friendly, that we drop that, that we drop that and we be honest, and we be vulnerable so that Jesus can say, hey, you get it. Come take a seat at the table and come be my disciple. I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. The church is a combination of sick and healthy people. Every one of us is sick. And there's only one treatment. There's only one cure. There's only one doctor. And his name is Jesus. So let's focus on being not just friendly, but being accepting of people. And that's it. If you are new, if you are, if you are new, actually, I'll start there. If you are new, if you are visiting for the first time, on your way out, our welcomers would love to give you a, a gift box just to say thank you for being here. But if you, have, if you feel challenged or you are struggling or any of this has hit a nerve with you or you just want to talk about it more, I will wait up here and I'm more than happy to pray with you, to chat with you and to help you meet Jesus if you haven't already. Other than that, head on out, go and be friendly and then be accepting. Go get your copies and have a wonderful week.